Who here loves to fail? <laughs> Other than the one in the back, we're going to have a separate TED Talk for you. <laughs> I don't like to fail, but I'm pretty good at it. What if I told you that the only way to learn and the only path to success is through failure? And that the biggest crusher of dreams isn't failure, it's the fear of failure. We have to overcome that fear to try, learn, and eventually succeed. Who here has just jumped on a bike the first time and boom, just started riding? No, it doesn't happen that way. Our parents had to tell us, come on, get on the bike, try again. You're going to fall, you're going to cut yourself, you're going to bruise yourself. But it's okay, because eventually you'll learn how to ride. And once you learn how to ride a bike, you never forget. You see, parents understand that there's a certain level of failure for their kids to learn a new skill, to achieve. But what is achievement? Is it learning the basics, mastering the basics? Is it being competent? Is it just fitting into society? Let's be serious. There are very few parents out there that encourage their kids, go ahead, give the backflip on the bike another try after they broke all their bones the first time, right? These kids, these kids end up at the X Games. The rest of us, we end up casually riding our bike along the river with our friends. And there is nothing wrong with that in terms of riding bikes. But life is a ride. And who just wants to master the basics? No, I don't. We want to do backflips at life, minus the broken bones, minus the failures. We want to skip all of that. That's not possible. In order to be successful in this world, we have to accept failure and be very persistent. Because I'm a sucker for public humiliation, allow me to share with you some of my most epic failures and how I jumped back up on the saddle after falling numerous times. My adult life started at the Johns Hopkins University in Maryland in the US. My parents, being good Arab parents, were supportive of my career choices. Only if I was a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer, <laughs> right? <laughs> you guys all know about that. So they were elated when I graduated with a triple major and a pre-med concentration from one of the most prestigious medical programs in the world. But these smiles didn't last, you see. I put my medical track on hold to pursue my passion, business. So my first business failed. My second business failed. My third business, yup, you guessed it, failed again. You starting to see a pattern here? But we didn't give up. And eventually, my brother and I started a voice over IP telecommunications company and a call center inbound outbound. This time, we put it all on the line. We took a loan against our only possession, our apartment in Washington, DC. This time, Failure didn't just mean jobless, it meant jobless and homeless. Success, backflips, right? We poured our heart and soul into it, and guess what? It worked. We eventually had 20 employees, and we thought we were Google. We thought we were huge, but it came at a cost, our health. Too much caffeine, too much nicotine, bad food, not enough time to hit the gym. The next thing you know, I'm 29 years old and 105 kilos of pure fat. I'm getting into my car, and as I bent over, I hear, Kruk! what is this? The suit pants rip at the bottom, and my underwear is out in the wind. <laughs> and it doesn't happen once, it happens twice. Talk about like public failure and embarrassment, right? That's it, something has to change, I said. After all, we own basically Google, I should have time to work out, do something. In comes triathlon, and boy am I glad that my parents insisted that I learn how to drive, ride a bike. Three short months later, I did my very first triathlon, and I was hooked. I absolutely loved it. Many people say I don't have a dial, but I have a switch. It's either on or off, and when it's on, I'm all in. And boy, was it on. The transformation began. I started to work, work out more and more, swim, 
spike, run, and support my brother and our business less and less. Eventually, my little brother said to me, you have a choice, an ultimatum. You come back to work or you take this seriously. I said, what do you mean take this seriously? He said, you go to the top. What's the top? New goal. At age 31, turn professional triathlete and go to the Olympic Games. I did the only thing I know how to do, and I dove in head first into my new life. Okay. This is when I experienced a very interesting phenomenon. Some of you already experienced it, and if not, you will sooner or later if you try to do something great, something big. It's not enough that we have these negative inner talks in our heads saying, are you good enough? Will you fail? Is this going to work? Oh, no. But the naysayers come out of the woodworks. Omar, you're too fat. Omar, you're too slow. Omar, you're too old. Omar, you're all washed up. But similarly to these negative thoughts in our heads, never, ever, ever listen to the naysayers. Believe in your vision. I did. And in my very first half Ironman on a triathlon bike, and at age 31, I earned my professional card in the US. I was also the first ever Egyptian professional triathlete. By, the eight, by 2013, I earned the world ranking. By 2014, I earned my and Egypt's very first Olympic points in triathlon. 2016, here I come. Until 18 months out of the games, I fell and break, broke my ankle. Six months out of the Olympic Games, I herniated two discs in my back. Five months out of the Olympic Games, I, a professional triathlete with 4% body fat, impeccable diet, three to eight hours of training regimen a day, get diagnosed with diabetes. It nearly crushed me. Did I put my training wheels back on? No, I kept on pushing. But by March 2016, it was clear. My Olympic spot was slipping between my fingers. What now? I dedicated six years of my life to this. Missed good times with my friends. Abandoned my brother to run our business and take care of our family. Driven my mind and my body into the ground. What now? In came a buddy of mine, Omar Samra. A famous uh, Arab adventurer and a hero of a man in his own right. He heard about the end of my Olympic quest and said, can I come see you? I said, absolutely. Let's take a look at what he suggested. My name is Omar Samra. I'm a mountain and polar adventurer. My name is Omar Noor. I'm a professional triathlete. Gently down the stream Merrily, 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 merrily Life is but a dream Thank you. Well, don't clap yet. Hold on. <laughs> Within two hours of him suggesting this crazy idea, we signed up to row across the Atlantic. I've never even been on a rowboat. 
Neither had Omar. I have no knowledge of rowing, of the sea of navigation, not even first aid, nothing. Why? Why was everybody's question? Because it was time. It was time for me to step out of my new comfort zone that became triathlon, to challenge myself. It was an opportunity to remind myself and the people around me to consistently push. It was also an opportunity for Omar and I to shed light on one of the most important issues our world faces today, the refugee crisis. So we partnered up with UNHCR. You see, Omar and I chose to face our fears. We chose and prepared to do this adventure. But for many people out there, they are forced to cross dangerous waters just to find a safe home, the most basic of human rights. So I applied every single thing that I learned through my business career and my triathlon career to tackle this adventure. I transformed my body from a skinny endurance athlete into a powerful ocean rower. And when I went to my diabetes doctor to explain to him what I was gonna do, he said, no, that is impossible for you. That is impossible with somebody with diabetes. And I don't even wanna tell you what my back doctor said to me. So I had to explain to them, docs, I don't think you understand. The decision has been made. It's now up to you to figure out how I do it in a safe manner. <laughs> we got on board and we were ready. By the time we reached the Spanish Canary Islands, we were ready, every single thing, we were ready for every eventuality out there. But nothing, nothing could prepare us for what was gonna happen to us. The start of the challenge was surreal. Imagine, imagine waking up in the morning and knowing that you're not gonna sleep for more than two hours at a time for the next 40 plus days. Imagine waving to your loved ones, knowing that you're about to embark on something so dangerous, you might never ever see them again. Talk about the fear of the unknown. And the first eight days were utter brutality. Reality slapped us on the face. My teammate, Omar Samra, he was extremely seasick for the first 24 hours. A very difficult situation for him. But it also meant that I had to pick up extra shifts. My longest shifts on the oars were seven hours straight. But we slowly made our way towards Antigua, towards safety towards our loved ones, towards fresh food and a warm bed. Man, that felt good, a warm bed. That is, until the morning of the 9th. A split second, the weather turned our adventure into a fight for survival. Suffice it to say, we were left for dead. Success, success wasn't anymore making money in the company. Success wasn't going to the Olympic Games. Success meant life. Failure meant death. The next 13 hours, we fought for our lives. And for the next 13 hours, our families had no idea whether we were alive or dead. It would have been so easy to give up there were so many times in that day when we could have given up, but we didn't. And this is the only reason why I'm standing in front of you today. Looking back at it, a lot of people could look at this experience in a very binary way. You either crossed the Atlantic or you didn't. You either lived or you died. You either succeeded or you failed. Let me tell you, it was one of the most amazing experiences in my life, the feeling of surviving that day. But survival wasn't enough. We wanted to make more of an impact with our story, to make maybe a better world. Maybe our own survival could help somebody else survive. So what did we do? We partnered up with a world-renowned director, Marco Orsini, and our partners in the row. And we created a film, a documentary, called Beyond the Raging Sea. I'm happy to report that it was featured in the 71st Cannes Film Festival as a work in progress, and we are now working on the full feature. Well, I can't obviously tell you all the details about the film. 
I'm really excited to be able to share with you a rarely before seen trailer. Enjoy. I would compare this race to other extreme sports. There isn't anything else that's like this. Two guys who really have no idea what rowing is about going across the Atlantic together. People who are forced to flee their homes has the right to cross an international border regardless of the means. We row from the Canary Islands to Antigua in the Caribbean. I didn't romanticize it too much. You must go through it in order to truly understand. Omar is uh, rocking it over here. And then all of a sudden, I'm underwater, and that's just everything changed. I, I looked at my hand, and I could see that my hand was just shaking and just full of blood. We must save these people. The life raft starts to collapse. The seas are relentless, and the open water is relentless. It doesn't forgive. Mom, I'm going to cross the Atlantic. So what, <laughs> thanks guys. So what do I want you guys to take out of my story? I want you to remember that success is going from failure to failure with good attitude. That the crusher of dreams isn't failure, it's the fear of failure. Be bold, be scared, be comfortable being uncomfortable. Focus on the things you can't control and accept the things you cannot control. And never, ever, ever give up. Some people achieve their wildest dreams. Why not you? Thank you. <laughs>